You coming here threatening my family? Huh? Guess you're gonna need a bigger stick, old man. Hey! Hey, wait! Wait! Hey, wait! Why is he doing this? Hey, why is he doing this? I did everything! Wait! Please, man. Please, man. Please, no. Please, no. Ignacio Varga, better known by his nickname Nacho, is one of the most compelling villains turned anti-heroes in the Breaking Bad universe. Only appearing in the spin-off prequel show Better Call Saul, we see Nacho's story tragically continue to spiral out of control, as he struggles to find security in his unforgiving and volatile world. And whenever he tries to build himself up, his choices inadvertently lead to his own downfall, in a slow and painfully tense demonstration of how to lose control. Michael Mando's phenomenal performance paired with the excellent writing team combined to produce a fantastically gripping character whose story surpasses almost every other in the Breaking Bad's legacy, at least in my opinion. Nacho's character arc seems to reflect that of Jesse Pinkman of Breaking Bad, both influenced by their bad choices, both heightened by maintaining a moral grounding through protecting the innocent, both forced into servitude by blackmail and powerful people yet never falling down into the depths of sociopathy that we see in other deprived murderers in their drug world. Nacho starts off much deeper in the criminal world than Jesse, already right-hand man to the complete nut job Tuco at his first appearance. We know how truly volatile the drug cartel families are from Breaking Bad, and from our own preconceived notions of drug criminals, so we expect the same from Tuco and all of his cronies, Nacho included. However, instead of blindly supporting Tuco and his violent tendencies as we've seen in any other grunt, Nacho immediately subverts the high energy and bloodthirsty expectations by remaining quiet and logical. Our first impression of the guy is him convincing Tuco to spare Jimmy, even after Jimmy just admitted, however fictitious it might have been, that he's an agent of the FBI. Not to say that Nacho is a completely good guy. Compliance and management of a drug organization is nothing to be proud of. But he refuses to take that extra step of completely turning off his empathy as we see in other villains and henchmen. He carries a code of honor while conducting his drug business, which we don't see too often from anyone affiliated with the drug cartel. The only two that come to mind being the aforementioned Jesse as well as Mike Ermintrout. Nacho always looks out for what's best for himself, even starting his own drug trade behind Tuco's back. We see that he acts very opportunistically, but not so much as to cause his own detriment. While he's willing to steal from others and is shown to be rather good at it, he only chooses to steal from the Kettlemans, Daniel Warmald, and presumably other such criminals. Even so, Nacho is not shy from threatening others in order to ensure his own safety. Unlike other staples of the Salamanca family, every single move Nacho makes is calculated and methodical. He only chooses the fights that are winning battles for him, and beneficial to his own goals. At least at first. And like any good criminal, he has always maintained a distinct separation between his home life and that of the criminal underworld, which is why he gets so rattled and defensive when Mike finds him in his legitimate family business. Eventually, he calculates that Tuco's meth-induced fits of rage are too much for his own safety, and because of this, he doesn't even think twice to try to order his removal. And even when he considers doing this, he employs Mike, someone who he thought threatened him and his father not too long ago. But while other villains would not even forgive a slight gesture of malice, Nacho is able to recognize Mike's heightened moral code and his insane levels of discipline to the extent that he's willing to bring Mike in on his treacherous plans and continues to do so throughout the rest of the series. However, while Nacho thinks that these moves ensure his safety in this volatile market, he continues to lose himself and become what he sought to fight against. When Tuco is out of the picture, we see Nacho's calm yet tough nature encompass the decisions that he makes as the uh, new de facto head of logistics for the Salamanca operation. However, Don Hector forces him to act tough and mercilessly when dealing with their drug distributors. Nacho wants his workers to pay him back. Don Hector wants to make sure that they pay back with both money and blood. The longer he spends in power, the more his character corrupts, and he adopts the Salamanca bloodthirst even after their absence. His time under the Salamanca reign is essentially turning him from collected Nacho to a light version of Tuco. When Don Hector decides that Nacho's father's business is the most stable front for cartel distribution into the US, Nacho realizes that this will certainly put his honest father in danger. The only thing he thinks to do at this point is to completely kill the Don and stop his integration plans. His creativity and meticulous thinking skills come in full force when he formulates a plan to switch Don Hector's Lytostril pills with ibuprofen 
having the foresight to break the AC of the drug headquarter front in order to get Don Hector to take off his jacket. This ultimately opens up an opportunity for Nacho to make the episode's titular switch. Successful in switching the pills, Nacho remains in awe that Hector stays standing after taking the ibuprofen multiple times. In a desperate effort to save him, Nacho reconciles with his father to play along with the operation and save himself. And when this also doesn't work, Nacho resolves to just shoot the Don and get it done. When Don Hector finally collapses that night, we can see the relief in Nacho's eyes. His father is finally safe. After Nacho was falsely held in police custody for robbing and kidnapping the Kettlemans, a crime Nacho was actually planning on committing, Nacho thinks that Jimmy is the one who ratted out on him. Even after being released, Nacho still promises his vengeance on Jimmy, to which Jimmy says that he was only looking out for the kids. Nacho was visibly offended that Jimmy would even accuse him of hurting children, and Wallen said, we later learn that this protection of the innocent is not an anomaly for Nacho, but the norm. We see this again after Don Hector murders an innocent, good Samaritan civilian for getting too close to their drug operation. And we see Nacho noticeably unnerved. And that good Samaritan? Hector shot him in the face. As I said before, easily the most redeemable character in all of Breaking Bad is Jesse Pinkman himself. He's the only person who consistently and uncompromisingly defends the innocent from the horrors of the drug world, especially towards children. We see many examples of this from the unnamed child to Brock to Drew Sharp, and many other examples of his childlike benevolence peeking its way through the criminal exterior, even going so far as to put himself in harm's way to fight for the security of children. And we see that Jesse's explicit defense of children is reflected in Nacho through implied dialogue and facial expressions. However, Nacho's real conviction is with the innocence of adults. While you could say that Nacho's defense of innocent people began with his defense for Jimmy against Tuco's wrath in the desert, he later reveals in the episode bearing his same name that he already thought that Jimmy was in the game at that point. So, when we continue to look at him and his actions throughout the series, we see that that true first example of his defense of innocent people came with that same good Samaritan who was not in the game who was completely outside of anything related to the drug organization being shot and killed. And that is the first example that we see of him being visibly and audibly disgusted at the cartel's merciless actions. Later on in the series, we see the cartel taking over a Pollos Hermanos to intimidate rival drug leader Gus. We see another example of Nacho's mercy towards innocent people. When Arturo prevents a mother and child to leave the restaurant after their takeover, Nacho signals the man to let her go his face seemingly baffled that someone is unable to recognize the difference between intimidating a fellow drug lord's legitimate business and holding innocent civilians hostage. The most continuous and blatant defense of the innocent is Nacho's utmost devotion to his father's safety. From the very beginning, Nacho knows that if the underworld got anywhere near his father, he would call the police and get himself killed out of his own unwavering honor. So Nacho does all that he can to prevent this from happening, risking his life in poisoning Hector until he exhausts all possible options and has to come clean with his father, desperately pleading for him to take the Don's bribe and stay quiet. His father is the one person Nacho comes to in his desperation whenever he gets backed into a corner and has no one else to turn to in his absolute lowest points. He's the only thing in his life that makes sense in trying to save his father, he finds himself stuck in the middle of a blood feud spanning decades, squeezed between the cold-blooded ruthlessness of Gustavo Fring and the uncompromising fury of the Salamanca family. He loses himself and begins to spiral. Originally, he only sought to save himself from Tuco's wrath. And when he does so with Mike's help, Nacho finds himself in a more lucrative position in the cartel. And as such, he begins to be corrupted by it. He goes from threatening dealers that don't pay what they owe to beating them up and teaching them a lesson. When Don Hector finally succumbs to his heart problems, Nacho thinks that he is finally safe. A little as you know, he just got in the way of Gustavo Fring's decades-long plot for vengeance against Don Hector. Outraged at the thought of losing everything, Gus threatens Nacho into becoming a spy in the Salamanca operation, ultimately cementing his place in that criminal world. Gus forces Nacho to do his bidding under direct threat of losing everything. Meanwhile, the Salamancas only implicitly threatened Nacho before to keep him in line. 
Nacho was stuck, no way out, and is forced into this whole scheme to set a fire under the Salamanca's operation and ultimately stage a hit. Over the course of Better Call Saul, we see how the choices Nacho makes effectively destroys his chances of freedom from the criminal world. Before the show, Nacho gets his first scar from working with the Salamancas, when Tuco shot a friend, Doug Paulson, in the face. A part of Doug's skull got stuck in Nacho's left shoulder, and has remained there ever since. Nacho's body is the perfect allegory for his soul being corrupted by the criminal world. At this point, he could still very well walk away from everything and keep his integrity, his body still belonging to himself. But after being pushed and threatened, Nacho goes deep enough where he steps beyond of that point of no return. The exact moment is Season 4, Episode 3, when he finally becomes Gus's puppet and loyal Salamanca soldier. In order to stage this fake hit, Nacho has to get shot by Victor in his right shoulder. In the same way that the Salamancas caused Doug's shrapnel bone to be stuck in his left, the bullet fired by Gus's crew gets stuck in his right. This represents how deep in both sides he's finally become. Not only that, but after this fake hit, he is revived by taking in literal cartel blood into his body. At this point, he becomes a walking embodiment of the criminal drug war that he gets caught up in the middle of, and tries he might to fight against it. He ultimately loses control. Jesse, the most innocent out of Breaking Bad's cruel characters, goes 33 episodes until he's finally coerced into killing for the first time. So it's fitting that Nacho should claim his first on-screen kill in episode 34 of Better Call Saul. Jesse kills Gale, a character we care a lot about and got to know, and we're left with a whole season to ponder the ramifications of that action. Meanwhile, Nacho effortlessly kills an unnamed grunt, all in an effort to fight for the lie that will save him and his father. With Tuco gone, Don Hector in a coma, and the cousins in Mexico, it looks like the heat is finally off of Nacho, and he can be the man of the operation with only the looming threat of Gustavo Fring over him. He essentially takes on Don Hector's identity, and even trains Crazy Eight to be as liberal with violence as he finally is, instead of using simple idle threats as he used to do. And he demonstrates this by ripping off one of the dealer's earrings, recognizing the danger he's still in, maybe even recognizing how much of himself is lost. Nacho immediately goes back home after this confrontation and checks in on the fake IDs for him and his father, presumably still planning for a way out if he can find it. And of course, he later becomes Lalo Salamanca's right-hand man, and secures not only his trust, but that of the entire cartel enterprise, gaining even the support of Don Eladio at the very top. But at this point, he is so deep in playing both sides of the blood feud that he disregards his own safety, risking both his capture by the DEA as well as his death should anything go awry. No, at this point he only cares about his father's safety, attempting to buy his dad's legitimate business to get him to leave. And when that doesn't work, he resolves to kill Lalo and stop Gus's explicit threats on his father. He's going to do whatever he can. Nacho is forever marked by his dealings in the criminal world, constantly unprepared despite his acute foresight. No matter how hard he pushes to gain some level ground, the criminal world pushes back harder. A scar from the Salamancas on his left, a bullet from Gus on his right, and cartel blood flowing inside him. Nacho's body has become a vessel for the criminal drug world. No matter how much he tries to build up his own security within the underworld, and even when he tries to create an exit strategy for him and his father, remember that the bullet in his shoulder might set off metal detectors from now on. No matter how hard he tries, he is forever marked by both that bullet in his shoulder and also inadvertently by his ego and panicked narrow-mindedness. Thinking that getting rid of Tuco or killing the Don or even trying to kill Lala would stop the torment that was the same untethered arguments that Walter would use to justify his own de-evolution into Heisenberg. But whereas Walt's corrupt soul used the excuses to justify his criminal actions, Nacho believes that his criminal actions are justified to save his own soul. And in trying to save his soul, he only falls further into the pool that corrupts it. As he continues to dip further into his schemes to provide himself and his father any safety whatsoever, Nacho inadvertently sinks into more turbulent waters until he completely loses control. This is the Malmadius, and thank you for watching. Are you coming here threatening my family? Adios, Nachito. I warn you. You are I warn you. mine. Guess you're gonna need a bigger stick, old man. Looks like a school bus for six-year-old pimps.